I was there. In 1998, I was in Chicago as the columnist for the Chicago Tribune. And I had the privilege of getting to watch the last dance and write about it from the inside out. And late in that season, I got to do two big one-on-one -on -one interviews with the two men whose disintegrating relationship was the reason that Michael Jeffrey Jordan prematurely ended his career by two years in my humble estimation. In March of that year, I got to sit down with Jerry Krause, the GM, and in early May, during the Charlotte playoff series, I had a big, long one-on-one -on -one with Phil Jackson, the head coach, obviously. Both of those men were hugely at fault for prematurely ending the prime of Michael's career. Phil, as much as Jerry Krause, as I will get to in just a minute, because let me tell you, I found the Zen master, as they called him, to be a spin master, also at fault. Also, this all-time, all-time blame pie has to be shared by one-third by the owner of the Bulls and also of the White Sox, Jerry Reinsdorf, who incomprehensibly empowered Jerry Krause with total control of the basketball team. And obviously, Jerry Krause had completely fallen out with Phil Jackson, had announced before the year Phil would be brought back for just one more year, but he could go 82-0 and he would still lose his job. Even though Michael had made it clear publicly, if Phil goes, I go. In all my years, I have never encountered a more confounding conflict than this one. The things I heard in those two interviews blew my mind and remember, you could suppose my mind had already been blown in Dallas. I had just come from Dallas, Texas, where I'd written three books about the Dallas Cowboys. And the middle book predicted that Jerry Jones would fire Jimmy Johnson sooner than later. Look it up. Last chapter, I predicted that. Show I was doing at that point at ESPN, the producer called me out after a show I did and said, you are out of your mind to say that he's going to fire Jimmy? Jerry's going to fire Jimmy? They just won a Super Bowl together, and obviously they were about to win a second Super Bowl together. That firing was completely predictable and comprehensible to me because it was simply about credit. Jerry didn't want to show the world he could win without Jimmy. He just wanted Jimmy to respect him, to appreciate him just a little bit, and Jimmy just didn't. In my second book, I did give Jerry Jones some credit for the building of that Super Bowl team in 1992. Jimmy did not like that. Jimmy wanted all the credit, and because he didn't feel like Jerry had paid any dues to become the general manager of the Dallas Cowboys, he just bought his way in while Jimmy played, paid dues all the way up the ladder, the coaching ladder. In the end, Jerry did deserve some credit. And in the end, Jimmy couldn't stand it to the point that he ridiculed and shamed and insulted his boss, Jerry Jones, in front of assistants and front office staffers to the point that after the second Super Bowl, there was a little gathering at a restaurant, the NFL owners meeting, and Jerry Jones proposed a toast in front of assistant coaches and Jimmy at the far end of the table to the Dallas Cowboys. Jimmy wouldn't toast, wouldn't raise his glass. To the Dallas Cowboys, still wouldn't raise his glass. Jerry went back to his hotel and announced to the media, I am firing him and hiring Barry Switzer as the next coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Totally predictable to me, and I was right about that one. This one I can't figure out because as I sat down with Jerry Krause for the first time that March as they were heading toward the playoffs, the first thing Jerry Krause told me was, I will never lie to you. Okay, so help me out, Jerry. 
Why is there this rampant rumor that you've already made a handshake agreement with Tim Floyd? The coach at Iowa State is going to replace Phil Jackson next year? Jerry scoffed at it. There is no truth to that. I don't know where it started. I said, Jerry, I'm around the team. They derisively refer to Tim Floyd as Pink Floyd because Phil Jackson loved the British rock group from the 60s, 70s, Pink Floyd. So they're calling Tim Floyd Pink Floyd sarcastically, derisively, because they think it's a done deal. And by the way, I'll fast forward quickly to my first sit down with Phil Jackson that May. And he said to me right out of the box, first thing I asked was, do you really think Tim Floyd's a done deal? This is the quote from Phil to me on the record in the middle of the playoffs. Oh, absolutely, said Phil to me. Jerry's already committed himself. It'll be tough on Tim Floyd. Jerry has set up a difficult situation for him. Phil on the record to me in his office at the Berto Center. What? And by the way, he was right about that because he was presupposing Michael would leave if he left. And Michael did. And <laughs> Pink Floyd, Tim Floyd, who was a fine young college basketball coach at New Orleans and then at Iowa State, he got him to the NCAA's three straight years. They're pretty good. He was a nice guy. I got to know him very well. Very good young coach. The next three Bulls teams coached by Tim Floyd went 13 and 37, 17 and 65, and 15 and 67 without Michael Jeffrey Jordan. The other quote from Phil that day that resonated to me was, you ready for this one? How that guy, Jerry Krause, remains in this organization's alpha position is mind boggling. That's Phil about Jerry Krause, is mind boggling as it was to me. So now back to my sit down with Jerry Krause. I ask him, Jerry, it, it seems like when I'm around, Michael's just merciless on you, just ridicules you in front of the rest of the team and the coaches. And Jerry says to me, oh, Michael and I needle each other, we rib each other, but that's somewhat normal. No, it wasn't normal at all, Jerry. You're delusional. And then he says to me, I, I don't see how anybody could get the idea that I'm eager to see Michael Jordan leave. Well, I was getting that idea because you were real eager to see Phil Jackson leave. And then Jerry Krause said something to me that stunned me and enlightened me. He was talking about who he admires the most in the NBA. And he said, the legacy of Red Auerbach in Boston, the sort of owner GM in Boston, the president of the Celtics. And what did Jerry Krause love the most about Red Auerbach? He said he won championships with three different teams. So clearly, Jerry Krause wanted to show the world, I can do it. I can win without Michael Jeffrey Jordan or Phil Jackson. And by the way, I got to give Jerry a little bit of credit here. He did pick Scottie Pippen out of Central Arkansas. Everybody knew Scottie was very good, but he had the guts to take him with the fifth overall pick, and he became a very good Robin to Batman. And he did, I'm not sure he discovered Tony Kukoc, but because he was regarded as the Michael Jordan of Europe, but he had the guts to pick him, bring him over in a couple of years. And he was a sixth man of the year. Very, very good, very good player. Nice compliment coming off the bench. I'll give you that. And most of all, I will give you Phil Jackson because Phil buddied up to little Jerry Krause, sucked up to him, kissed up to him, told him he loved him fooled him, convinced him that they were a, a team. And as the Bulls assistant, he ingratiated himself enough with Jerry Krause, did Phil Jackson the spin master, not the Zen master, that Jerry eventually fired Doug Collins, who had coached Michael for three years. And Michael loved him. They'd had some off the court differences, but he still loved him. Because remember, Michael hired that man to coach him, Doug Collins, in, in Washington in his last two years. He brought Doug with him to Washington for the age 38 and 39 last hurrah years in Washington. 
So Phil bamboozles Jerry Krause, gets Doug Collins fired, and then once they broke through and won 90-91 in that, the first championship run, Phil turned on Jerry Krause. He didn't love Jerry Krause. They weren't buddies. They weren't a team. And he began to ridicule and shame him. And it just tore Jerry Krause apart that he got taken by Phil Jackson. And I don't blame him. And I had some sympathy for him. So as I left that interview and I went home to write, what occurred to me was Jerry Krause is the penguin. Remember the 1992 Batman movie, the one directed by Tim Burton, starring Danny DeVito as the villain, the Penguin? Remember the story? And by the way, if you don't know Jerry Krause, you've probably seen him in the documentary. He was a little man, and a pudgy little man, and he kind of waddled like a penguin. And you know what the story was in the 1992 Batman, that Danny DeVito's parents, when he was an infant, just dumped him and his carriage into the Gotham City sewer system, and he was rescued and raised by penguins, and he became the penguin, right? And the penguin got hired by the power broker of Gotham City, the evil power broker, Christopher Walken, Max Schreck, to do his dirty work for him. And the penguin's weakness was he wanted so badly to be loved by everybody, just like Jerry Krause. But he couldn't overcome Michael, as in not Michael Jordan, but Michael Keaton, who was playing Batman, couldn't overcome that Michael either. And it was a bingo for me, and I got a lot of very positive reaction to the column I wrote in which that was the whole lead in. Jerry Krause is the penguin, and, and you have some sympathy for the penguin, but in the end, he's just wrong because he's on the wrong side. And he's never going to beat Batman. And he's, he's always going to be viewed as the ultimate villain. That's how Jerry Krause went down in history. So I wrote the piece. It ran banner across the top of the sports page at the Chicago Tribune. Now I fast forward to that Charlotte playoff series. Close out game at Charlotte on a Sunday afternoon. Went to the locker room an hour or so after the game. As I'm walking back through the concourse to go right, my column, I stopped off at the public restroom, giant public restroom, which was empty because the fans had cleared out because they had lost and it was over. And I walk into the restroom and who's in there but Jerry Krause. How weird is that? What a weird place to sort of bump into each other. And we locked horns and Jerry Krause tore into me. How could you write that about me? How could you shame me that way? How could you do that to my family, he said to me. I said, Jerry, number one, you're a public figure. You're in the crosshairs between Michael Jordan and, and Phil Jackson and you, and you're on the wrong side of history. I said, Jerry, how could you do that to your Bulls family? Do you realize how bad this is going to be? You can't do that. That's personal to me. I did great things. He told me, one of his quotes was, I hired Phil. It was a great move. He said, I got castrated by every typewriter in Chicago for hiring Phil in the first place. That worked out pretty well, didn't it? Okay, I give you all that, Jerry, but I'm not going to give you sending Michael Jordan into retirement two years prematurely. So now, Fast forward to the Phil interview up in his office, second floor of the Berto Center, Deerfield, Illinois, northern suburb, northwestern suburb of Chicago. And I said, Phil, th this is nuts what's going on. He said, oh, th this is totally beyond sense and reason. He agreed. He I said, is there any way out of this situation? This is early May. He said, it will take a Machiavellian effort by a neutral party to make oil and water mix. Okay, so I said, you have anybody in mind? And Phil looks at me straight faced and said, yeah, OJ Simpson. OJ Simpson? He could resolve this? I think he was saying it would take a snake of a scoundrel 
to be able to deal with what he saw as a snake of a scoundrel in Jerry Krause. Phil could really spew those quotes. He was a quote machine, the spin master was. And his final quote to me was, we've all painted ourselves into corners and dot, 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 out of which nobody can, can escape. And yet, I must tell you that as I began to get to know Jordan through the last dance season, I began to hear a different tune from him because during that playoff run, at one point, Phil was just on the record with everybody, I go, Michael goes. And I, I asked Michael at one point after a playoff game about Phil's recommendation that he retire. And you know what Michael said? He coldly replied to me as I wrote in the Tribune, that's Phil's opinion. And it gave me pause because it made me wonder, and I wrote this paragraph in the Tribune, perhaps Michael Jordan realized that Jackson isn't that essential. Perhaps Jordan saw that in the end, Jackson and Krause were no more than a couple of June bugs splattering on his finals windshield as he roared toward another title. Perhaps Jordan became irritated and even challenged by Jackson's sentiments that he, Jordan, was running on empty. Boom, loved it, agreed with it. So I wrote in the Tribune, why can't Michael Jordan say, okay, go to Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner, and say, look, it's clear that Krauss and Phil have fallen completely apart, bridge burned, unfixable. Both of them are at fault in different ways. I want to play again in 99 and 2000, let's say. I think we're young enough to win again because they were. They were plenty young enough to win again with that same team. You could upgrade it with a draft pick or a free agent here or there. That team still would have been favored the next two years. Michael was still at the end of his prime. He was 34 at that point. And what if he'd gone to Reinsdorf and just said, look, let me bring back Doug Collins. Let, let me just have him for two more years. It's okay. We can fix this. Just give me a coach with credentials, somebody I respect and trust and know. Not Tim Floyd. I can't do that. I don't want to start over with some college coach, Pink Floyd. Give me Doug Collins. Give me anybody else. Give me somebody with some stature and credentials. Why wouldn't he do that? Well, as I wrote, Phil Jackson had like this Spengali influence over Michael Jordan that I never quite understood. Michael could be impressionable and Phil could be very silver-tongued convincing. And he had this weird vibe hold over Michael and he had somehow convinced Michael, if I go, you gotta go. You gotta do it to Krauss because they had made their battle cry of the whole year, last dance us against Krauss and Reinsdorf, against the two Jerrys. Okay, that worked, and they won a sixth championship in six tries. Six and oh with six MVPs in the finals. That will work, that's the greatest, that's the GOAT. But it doesn't need to stop now, it doesn't have, that Phil proclaimed it the last dance because it was his last dance. It didn't have to be Michael's last dance. It was just wrong. You gotta break the hold, so I wrote in the Tribune, Here's hoping Phil Jackson has danced his last dance on Jordan's sometimes impressionable psyche. And I wrote that this is the most offensive sports thought I can think. Jordan prematurely retired at 35 while Phil Jackson is coaching elsewhere at 53. Boom. Guess what happened? One year later, it wasn't when he was 53, he was 54. Phil lands in LA as the coach of Shaq and Kobe. He goes from Jordan to Shaq and Kobe, and they won the first that year of three straight championships. So he wins, Jordan loses. I don't get it. Why would Jordan sacrifice the end of his prime for Phil Jackson? It made no sense to me. Phil had duped Jerry Krause into hiring him, and then completely turned on Jerry Krause and turned Jordan completely against him. I get that. 
That was a great motivational tactic on Phil's part, but it didn't have to be that way. The spin master was at fault at least as much as Jerry Krause was. But alas, you know what happened. Phil had to go and Michael Jordan soon walked into the sunset, I guess out of loyalty to Phil, and he was gone for the final three years of his prime, that's ages 35, 36, and 37, mostly because of the Penguin and the Spin Master and an owner who would not own this situation. Even as I retell this story, I'm feeling sick all over again because in all my career, I've never ever seen anything like that. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here to get the latest from the show and be sure to check out more of the best clips from Undisputed or go watch a few other segments from our other shows on FS1.